Hello, I'm Becky Hadid, host of The Storied Recipe. As my weekly guests share their stories through the vessel of cherished food memories, we all become better cooks, more grateful for the gift of food, and we honor those that have loved us through their cooking. Hello, listeners. I'm thrilled you're here, and I am so humbled and grateful to welcome Diana and Silva to the podcast today with a set of stories that will challenge and inspire us all to live with more love. Diana is a YouTuber, podcaster, and author of the book Mole Mama, a memoir of love, cooking, and loss. The book begins when Diana's mother, Rose, was given just three days to live. It then chronicles the 13 months that Rose outlived that diagnosis, the second time in her life that she survived against the odds. As Diana walks with her mother deeper and deeper into the valley of the shadow of death, she also cooks for her. And in this way, Diana sustains her mother, comforts her, and finally learns the delicious Mexican recipes that Rose cooked for the 15 children, yes, 15 children, and hundreds of migrant workers that she welcomed into her home over 50 years. We have so very much to learn from both Diana and Rose in this episode as their lives challenge us to love with greater sacrifice, endurance, and joy. Hello. Hello, Ms. Becky. How are you? (laughs) I'm so good. I'm so happy to hear your voice. Likewise. So wonderful to speak with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, Diana, it is honestly, it is deeply, deeply my honor to have you on the podcast and to have read this book about your mother and to talk with you about all of it tonight. So really, I feel so honored. I feel like what we're going to talk about is really quite sacred, actually. Oh, that's really sweet. And I'm sorry, my dog is here and she's oh. and I, <laughs> I love it. I'm so sorry. So, so let's talk about, first of all, this name. Mole Mama. So first of all, what are all the arenas in which you use this name? Your YouTube channel? What else do you have out there in the world? I have a YouTube channel. I have Instagram and I have a website and a Facebook account. Okay. And my podcast. <laughs> so yes. Are, so yeah, <laughs> those are all the areas. And then it's also um, part of the name of my book. So. Yes. Yes. Do you consider your YouTube channel and your podcast to be one and the same at this point? No, no, I don't. Because my YouTube channel, in addition to having several of my podcasts there, Mm -hmm. I also have cooking videos, several cooking videos. So yes. Right, right. And one of them, (laughs) what is your dog's name? (laughs) This is Sophia who's joined us. Oh, Sophia. (laughs) Sorry about that. (laughs) Oh my goodness. And on one of these, on one of these videos, you're actually making the mole, correct? Yes, I actually have two videos with mole. So I have one where I make the traditional mole rojo because there's a there's actually I think seven varieties of mole. But the two the way they really break into two different categories is is mole dulce, so a sweet mole, mm. or mole rojo, so a spicy one. Mm. And my family we are more about the mole rojo. So I have a video on there that's the traditional mole rojo that you make from four different dried peppers. And it's, it's pretty much an all day event. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then I also created a 30 minute video, which, you know, it's only 10 minutes, but it's a 30 minute version of my recipe, which is really easy. And it's really delicious. I would say you're giving up on flavor, maybe like five or 10%, but you're getting there. It's yeah. It's yeah. Okay. So what, how would you actually define a mole sauce? The first time I ever heard of a mole sauce, it was a cooking magazine I loved. And it said categorically, a mole sauce is a spicy Mexican sauce with chocolate in it. That's one of the varieties. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So correct all of us and all the American cooking magazines and tell us for real, what is a mole sauce? So it is a, usually a thick sauce Mm -hmm. and think of it almost like a curry. Mm. And I think of it as there's curries and then there's all the French sauces Mm -hmm. 
And then there's moles. So it starts mm. out with a roux and the mole rojo that I was talking about usually has peppers, lots of different peppers normally and spices and it's very spicy. And mole dulce is where you get into the chocolate and the nuts and even bread. But I think broader than that, and it originated in Oaxaca and Mexico. And mm. I think why this name is because if you grew up in a Mexican household where your mother made mole or your grandmother made mole, mm -hmm. most likely in your heart, that's the best mole you've ever had. Mm. <laughs> so when this yes. name came to me, my brand is so influenced by my mother, Rose. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, she made the best mole on the planet. Mm. And so when I was thinking about the name Mole Mama, I was like, you know, I think so many Latinos will be able to identify mm -hmm. with mole. And also, I think it's about showing up to do your best or leaving your best behind. Mm. Because in my connection with food and other food that I've eaten of other in other Mexican homes, it's about the mole. It really is. Mm, that is such a great explanation. And I had a guess because I thought, okay, so after, especially after reading the book, I thought, okay, so who is the original mole mama? Is it Diana or is it Rose, Diana's mother? But really, it's a universal mama. Yes. It's a universal mama. Mm, love it. Love it. And a reminder that your mama always did best and she wants you to do your best too, huh? Yes. And I, and I also think that there can be more than one best, mm, right? Because yeah. I think in our, sometimes in our very competitive culture, it's like, you know, who's going to go to number one? It's like, no, actually it's, it's, you know, what's your version of the best, mm -hmm. right? Yes. What sparks your cherished memories? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then mole often is put into tamales. Oh, okay. So when you have a tamale, I, I don't know if you've tried tamales before, but if it has a red sauce in there, like with any type of protein, mm -hmm. it's, lots of us make the, a mole to go inside our tamales. Okay. So it's very foundational. It's used in celebrations, you know, for parties and fiestas and birthdays. And it's just a really big part, I would say, of our cooking and of our culture. Yes. It's so helpful to me to think of it, like you said, as a curry, because mm -hmm. everyone knows if you go to an Indian restaurant, I mean, there's an entire section of curries. And if you follow Indian cooks on Instagram, there's I may not be exaggerating to say thousands of curries. I've certainly been given recipes I didn't even know existed. And so to say a mole sauce is like a curry, that's such a helpful way of thinking about it. It's the consistency is very similar. And I know that I have several Indian friends that are vegetarians and I've adapted my mole many times to use sweet potatoes and cauliflower and different mm -hmm. veggies instead of using a protein. And it's really delicious that way mm. too. So it's adaptable. And yes. I think curries are also quite adaptable. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And regional as well. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so helpful to know. So, And I don't think you see it in restaurants very often because it is the traditional mollies are, are quite labor intensive and hard to make. And then also it might be an acquired taste since mm. it's not something that you really eat outside of your home much. Mm. So I don't think it's hit the mainstream yet. I'm trying to change that, but mm. I don't think it's quite... Mm. Yeah. Well, that is something that I'd like to talk about because can you compare maybe what a typical American would eat in a quote Mexican restaurant and what your experience with Mexican food is? And what would you like us to know about what true authentic Mexican cooking is like? So this is from my California <laughs> experience because that's where yeah. I live. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, many, many Californians relate when they think about Mexican food. It's it's a taco, it's a burrito, you know, maybe it's a tostada, and it's rice and beans and you know, salsa and guacamole. And mm -hmm. And I don't know, and enchiladas, maybe. So it doesn't really, or roll and roll tacos, but I don't think it goes beyond that. And the thing about Mexican cooking is it 
as you mentioned earlier, it's so regional and it's mm. so diverse. Mm-hmm. And I grew up eating, you know, there's so many different types of soups and seafood. And Mm -hmm. now I, I refer to some of the recipes that I make that were my mother's is off the grid because you've never had them in a restaurant. And Mm -hmm. I've had people come for dinner and they'll be like, what is this? And I'm Mm -hmm. like, Oh, it's, you know, so I make this thing called calabacitas with carne de puerco. And it's this spicy, heavy, it's all think of it almost like a, a pork stew mm. with zucchini and mm. it's spicy and mm. it's delicious. It's so good. Oh, that's fascinating. I think my husband would love that. Zucchini is <laughs> about his favorite vegetable and he loves spicy things. But there's a lot of influence in Mexican cooking from French cooking from really? Spanish cooking, be- well, because it was, <laughs> there are people coming into Mexico all the time, the French it, and the Spaniards. And so mm-hmm. it definitely influenced, I think, the flavors and some of the mm-hmm. sauces and, and, you know, some of the food is quite elegant. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it really mm-hmm. is. <laughs> so, right, right. So two questions, one, just as a follow-up. So Mexico was colonized by Spain. Was it also colonized by the French? I don't know if it was colonized, but I think there when one of the wars, the French were there as well, because the, the other thing about Mexico I think is fascinating is that there's such diversity as far mm-hmm. as the way people look. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I think that the typical is small and dark mm-hmm. and I'm quite tall. So people kind of get confused. How are <laughs> I'm, you? I'm very tall, actually. <laughs> um, so How tall like, are you, Diana? <laughs> I'm almost five nine. Are so, you? Yes. So people are like, wait, 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 wait. They get confused by that. Yeah. But it was also very tall. And my I have relatives that on one side of my mother's family who have like blonde hair and mm-hmm. blue eyes or hazel mm-hmm. eyes. And you're like, wait, you're Mexican? Mm-hmm. So there's but it was this because of, of these other cultures that mm-hmm. came into the country. Mm, I see. I see. Okay. So my second follow-up question is, I think that probably in California, this is a guess, based on a very short trip to California, (laughs) I think there's probably more authentic Mexican food available in California than there is where I live in the East Coast in Maryland. I think it's almost exclusively what you would call Tex-Mex, ground beef, handfuls of cheese, and Mexican can have the connotation of a very heavy meal. Would you say that that's typical of Mexican food or that's only one type of Mexican food? Certainly the meals that you make are hearty. That's for sure. Yeah, I I think that's a type of Mexican food. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think my recipes are hearty because most of them are my mother's Mm -hmm. and she and my grandmother were cooking for migrant farm workers. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's, so they were cooking for primarily men that were out in the fields and, you know, working very, very hard. So, mm-hmm. but not everything is like that for sure. And okay. espe- especially the seafood dishes mm-hmm. and some of the rices and, and a lot of the Mexican dishes, it, there's a lot of vegetables. We actually mm-hmm. eat a lot of vegetables and fruit. Mm-hmm. Because it's, there's it's, farms. Yes. And the whole cheese thing is very much an American thing. Yeah, like the cheddar cheese (laughs) that's from Wisconsin, not Mexico. (laughs) No, 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 no. They, yeah, they're using queso fresco and and they have some dried cheeses that are lighter. But like when one of my favorite spots outside of Guadalajara to get a burrito, it literally is a flour tortilla and whatever the filling is. So if that's mole, if it's calabacitas, and it's nothing else. Hmm. So we we do some interesting things in our country, but that's okay. Mm. We, you adapt it for your environment and that's, that's the way it is. And, mm. and the way I feel about it, Becky, is that I would rather somebody experience just fast food. Mm-hmm. And so they have a little bit of an understanding about our culture. Even if it's mm. not like what I grew up with, that's okay. As long as you understand just a little bit about us, I think that still is a connection. Well, yes. And hopefully it'll drive us to know more and seek yes. out people like you and your YouTube channel to find more authentic and layered and nuanced dishes. Right. Yeah. 
And and mine are not, let me be clear, are not that authentic. But again, because my mother grew up in, in California and she mm-hmm. puts cheese in things because I was <laughs> on a dairy farm. So she loved the cheese like I love the cheese. So a lot of our dishes have cheese. Mm, so. mm, mm. Okay, so we're, we're moving towards this. We're bringing your mom up. So let's really go to not just your mom, but also your grandmother. And you're going to need to help me with the pronunciation here. But even in your book your story starts with the gifting of a, is it called a mokahite? You're so close. It's a mokahete and it's so awesome to try to say it. Yes, (laughs) You're so kind. So your mother gifted you with this mokahete and tell us about that. Why is it so precious to you? And what would it say? What has it seen in its lifetime? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. My Molkahete is actually on the cover of my book, and that mm-hmm. was my grandmother's. And and think of it, if you don't know what it is, it's a think of it as a, a pest. Uh, I can't even say it in English, but it's a mortar, <laughs> mortar and pestle. I think yes, yes, mortar and pestle. <laughs> so that's what it is. But from Mexico, it's they're usually made out of volcanic rock. And when my grandmother Magdalena immigrated to this country legally, walked in, she had mm-hmm. one suitcase. And she had her molcajete mm-hmm. and she used it, you know, to grind up spices and to make sauces with it, salsas mm-hmm. and all kinds of things. And my mother gifted it to me. So I, I have our molcajete and I think that it has magical powers in it. And I'm like, <laughs> I use it all the time. It sits on my counter. It's a big part of my cooking and I just feel so incredibly connected to my mother and my grandmother when I use it. Mm. And I think about, you know, when I'm pounding it away, it's like, it's also a big stress reliever for me because that mm. sound, there's something about the sound <laughs> of just hitting it. Um, but I do feel that there is a connection and and so many families also, this is also a tradition where they might have their grand. I've heard from so many people going, Oh, I have my grandmother's mocha too, mm. or I have my mom's or mm. so it, it is something I think culturally that we pass from generation to generation. And if she mm. could talk, what could she say? Like mm. all the things and all the food that's been cooked in her and, or just part of a recipe that, you know, so anyway, mm. Mm. my most cherished possession for sure uh, from my family that I have. Mm. Very understandably so. It represents the strength and courage of at least two women. Do you know if it goes back further than your grandmother? I don't know that. Mm. But it's more than 100 years old just with those two. So. It's incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Mm-hmm. It really is metaphorical, I think, because it's so sturdy and so lasting. It works so incredibly well. Like you can smash up garlic in there like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> it's just <laughs> It's amazing. It's so fast. I need a mocha You do. <laughs> well, that was part of my question is that, you know, with a mortar and pestle, I always pictured, you know, they're normally quite small and you just put in kind of the solid spices and grind them up. But I got the impression from a couple passages in your book that you would mix softer things in there too, like maybe even add in the tomatoes at times. Yes, or- you can smash them up in there. Definitely. That's yeah. Amazing. So it depends okay. on what sauce you're making. The other thing that's also really interesting that people do with molcajetes is they actually cook with them. Oh, because um, they can withstand high heat. Right. So I have a couple of recipes. I have they're called queso fundidos or fundido. Yes. So that's made in a molcajete, and I have a recipe that's chorizo and all this different cheese and you use fire roasted poblano chilies and it is the end game dip (laughs) like cheese dip (laughs) like when I make that people lose their minds so there's actually in Mexico I've been to restaurants where that's all they do so think like a a fondue yes Uh uh-huh all they have is mocajete so there's all these different you can get mocajete is filled with seafood or filled with beef or veggies and they're just, they're beautiful and it's just kind of fun. So mm, yes, yes. It's kind of like an old time heftier, almost crock pot. It's this ceramic thing that you can <laughs> yes. put everything into, mix it all up and just heat it into something magical. Yes. Mm, mm, okay. Well, I mainly, we're mainly going to 
talk about your mother's story, but I would love to know, is there anything else you could or would like to share about your grandmother's story? Why did she leave Mexico and what was it like for her when she came here? And tell me a little bit about how she and your mom worked with the migrant farmers. Yes. So my grandmother, there was, she had seven children Mm. And when she came to this country, I think it was two of her daughter, her older daughters were already here Mm. and the family was just financially really struggling Mm -hmm. and they had been farmers in Mexico. And so her daughters came here and immediately started working in the fields. And so they actually paid her way so that she could come to this country. And Mm -hmm. and again, it was out of economic necessity Mm -hmm. and just really struggling And when she was here, she immediately started working in the fields Mm -hmm. and she gave birth to my mother here. So my mother was the youngest of seven, the only one born here. And my mother immediately also growing up, that's what she did as well, worked in the field. So they Mm -hmm. all worked in the fields. And eventually, I think my mother might have been, I I think she might have been like seventh, eighth grade when my grandmother was able to get this little business going of cooking so she could leave the fields. Mm -hmm. And so she would feed and have people actually stay at her home Mm -hmm. and then work in the fields because they're migrant workers, right? They're going Mm -hmm. from one harvest to the next. Mm -hmm. And where they grew up, actually all of the Mexican farm workers all lived in this one little community outside of town. Mm And I think, um, you know, my mom had fond, she shared fond stories with us of, as far as like all of her cousins being close by and family. So I grew up thinking that, you know, they had this kind of wonderful tight knit community. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this in my book, but I grew up on a farm as well. And there was definitely when I was growing up, we would, you know, there were things that we saw that you would consider to be quite racist. Mm -hmm. And my my mom would just always kind of downplay it. Mm -hmm. I was working in the fields as a young child as well. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. the media You personally, Diana were personally, yes. I picked strawberries. I think um on the weekends and stuff, I was probably like eight or nine years old. Wow. But hoeing beans and one of the times that I was out there, the migra came. So basically our ice today, they came into the fields. And so everybody dropped everything and started running. And I ran too. And, you know, we're hiding and, and people are, you know, I was crying because I was so scared. And when we finally, we were, we were, we were hiding. And one of my friends from the field said, you don't, but you don't need to worry. They won't take you. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Like, I, I had no concept of, me being born in this country versus them not like that as a child, I did not even know that that was a thing. And so when I went home and, you know, we didn't get caught and I was telling my mom about these really bad men that were chasing us and all this stuff. And my mother said, you know, don't hate them. That's their job. And you're not going to be able to understand how this works but people are working in the fields to feed their families. That's why they're here. But don't grow up hating the people that came in today. Just don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand at the time that that was a gift that my mother was always trying to get me to think about putting myself in somebody else's shoes Mm -hmm. and having me think, you know, those men that were chasing you, they're also feeding their families. They just Mm -hmm. have different types of work. But the politics, you're not going to understand that. Hmm. So it was much later on, I was already an adult when I found out that my mother had had all types of her personally different racist experiences where I didn't know um, when I was a child that in my community where I grew up that the Mexicans rode in the back of the buses, they were forced to do so. They were forced to drink from separate water fountains. They had separate movie nights that they got to go to. I didn't know any of that until I was about 25 years old because my mother never told us. And when she was dying and my sister and I were having this conversation with her about 
everything that she taught us. It was a beautiful conversation that we had because we got to actually talk very openly about how she had impacted our lives. Mm. And I just remember when I talked to her about when I found out like all these things that happened to her and I questioned, I was like, why did you not tell me? Why did you not tell me when I was younger that all these things happened? Mm -hmm. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And she said, she goes, because it would have changed you. Hmm. And I was like, what? I I, no, I I would have, I would have understood. And she said that she really wanted the hate to end with her. Mm. And she decided that the only way that that could happen is that if she did not tell us when we were children. And so that's actually something that I spoke about at her funeral, because Mm -hmm. I think that that is the greatest gift that my mother gave me was the ability to not see color, to not grow up with hate in my heart because of the way somebody looks or the way that my mother was treated because of the way she looked. Mm. I have so many, I have so many, I guess, just swirling thoughts and feelings. It's hard to articulate first. I want to just step back to your grandmother and just kind of note and reiterate what a physically difficult life this must have been for her to, I think, Uh, I've heard people joke about retiring and opening a bed and breakfast and saying, oh gosh, that would be so exhausting. Can you imagine? And I just want to note like your grandmother's easier life was essentially running a bed and breakfast for migrant workers. That was the easier part because she worked so many years from morning to night in a field. And it sounds like she was working there when she was pregnant with your mother. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. I'm sure she was. Which I just... Like, I just don't want to gloss over that. I kind of want us all to just slow down and pause and think about the exhaustion of working in a field in California, pregnant with your seventh child. That's amazing. It was. And that's, and that's something that people always talked about with her, that she was so incredibly strong. Yeah. Well, both of them are, but yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as for your mother and what she endured... I guess I have two questions about her choice, her decision, and I'm I'm curious your take on them because sometimes when one generation talks about what they suffered, well, I think there's there's two ways it can be it can be taken as a positive thing to talk about it, and I'm curious about your take. And the first would be simply to again just honor the story and the suffering of other people, you know. And second, to prepare the next generation for what they may face. And so I'm curious how this played out for you in terms of, one, did you feel that you had to face things that you weren't prepared for because you didn't know about how your family had been treated? And two, were you still able, and I know the answer to this, it's so clear from your book, but I'm going to ask it anyways, were you still able to understand and honor the sacrifices that your mother had made, even though she hadn't shared these things with you? Those are really excellent questions, Becky. Hmm. And I think to the first one, I think I was fine because my mother instilled in me to see things from somebody else's perspective, Hmm. to try I wasn't always successful at that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is that from the race perspective, I've had a few things happen, but, Mm -hmm. but really not, not so much. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of ran under the radar Mm -hmm. because I am so incredibly tall Mm -hmm. and I went gray really young. So I've been coloring (laughs) my hair forever. (laughs) So I just have lighter hair and, um, but even when I'm in Mexican markets, sometimes somebody will say something about, you know, me, the, the, the gringa in the store, and I'll be like, and I'll turn around and speak to them in Spanish. And they're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you also have no accent. Because I grew up in California. Mm-hmm. I actually have an accent where I don't speak Spanish as well as I could. <laughs> so mm-hmm. <laughs> the opposite. So I, I think it was fine because mm-hmm. she armed me with understanding Mm -hmm. We're trying to have understanding, which Mm. I think is really powerful. Mm -hmm. And then 
Absolutely. I, I have so much respect for mm-hmm. her and for my grandmother. And I know that many years ago, I was working in San Francisco for a very, very successful financial services company at the time. And mm-hmm. one of the women I worked with was from Mexico. But when people asked her where she was from, she would always tell them that she was Spanish. Hmm. When would ask me, I would say, I'm Mexican. And hmm. one day I went into the, her office and I'm like, why do you do that? I go, you're from Tijuana. Like, what's up with this? Hmm. And she's like, you know, well, people are going to look down on me. And I'm like, yeah, but aren't you proud? Like that you, hmm. your heritage was able and your family was able to get you educated. You have this great job. Like, like you need to be proud of that, mm-hmm. like where you came from. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I just talked about understanding. I was lecturing somebody, but anyway, I just <laughs> want to share that. I was like, come on. Well, yes. Is, right. Cause I just don't, I feel mm-hmm. like um, there is a lot of looking down at the farm workers and think of the sac- mm-hmm. like I think oh. sacrifice mm-hmm. that they're making for their families that, you know, my family made for me. And I'm mm-hmm. so incredibly grateful. Mm-hmm. So proud. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I want to talk about another experience in your mother's life because I I almost couldn't believe this as I was reading this, that this happened. But you talked about the fact that she lived for seven years in a tuberculosis ward. Yes. And I, you know, I was obsessed with Annie Sullivan, Helen Keller's teacher when I was younger. I don't know why. I was constantly searching for information about Annie Sullivan. I was amazed by her. And she actually grew up in a tuberculosis ward and her brother died in the bed next to her. And I was so struck by that story as a child. I mean, I was both terrified. I was mostly just terrified and like I grieved for Annie. I think that's part of the reason that I was so obsessed with her life is I was just so moved by what she had lost and suffered there. And that was in the 1800s. I couldn't believe that that happened to your mother this was at least the middle of the 20th century, at least in the 50s, right? So it was, um, she was 17. So it was like 1943 when she went in. Okay. So 17 to 24? Yes. She lived 17 to 24, some of the most magical years of life in a tuberculosis ward. Yes. And she got TB because she was taking care of one of her aunts. And at the time, people didn't know, like, great, you're sick. And so my grandmother sent her to take care of my aunt. And then she got sick. And so she ended up there. And the really sad, in addition to her being there for seven years, is that there were so many other family members that went in. Her, one of her sisters actually, and one of her little bro- one of her brothers and her sister's entire family, husband, two children, other cousins and relatives, but it was really my mother and one of my first cousins that walked out together. And my first cousin that went in shortly after my mother was eight Mm. years old. And so it was my mother's niece. And um, so the daughter of one of her older sisters. So the two of them were together for those seven years. And the stories about what they endured as far as you know, they laid flat on their backs and there were just all types of different experimental treatments. And Oh, like, no. Oh, yeah, because they didn't know how to save them. So they were trying to do anything they possibly could. So they, they weren't necessarily cruel. No, they were not cruel. It was just like they just kept trying different things. Oh. They did, there was no cure. And so um, my mother, when she was released, had to learn how to walk again. She could no longer walk when she came out. Mm. And they ended up removing one of her lungs. And so she had pretty extensive surgery and that's how they saved her. Mm. Um, so mm. it, it's just, and m- her family. So my grandmother could see them once a year and my grandmother didn't have a car and they were about an hour away driving time. So once a year, my grandmother and the family would go to see them, but that's all the, the visits she got. That's unreal to me. And when you say she and her first cousin walked out together. Do you mean that the others died? The others died. Yes. The others died. Wow. 
So let's keep going with this because that kind of suffering, what she, how young was she when she started working in the fields, by the way? I, I think she was probably five or six years old. I think, okay. I think they were all out in the fields. Very, yeah. very young. Yeah. And then I would also like to say that tuberculosis spread much more quickly among these populations because of the conditions, right? Mm-hmm. Than in right. other populations. So that's just a fact. So we have the fact that she had to work when she was five or six in the field. She got a disease that was mainly managed in other more privileged populations. She spent seven years in a tuberculosis ward. She lived in fear. You know, she and her community lived in fear and all of that suffering would, well, let's put it, it would make me bitter. I would be a bitter person, Diana. I, I have some bitterness and I've lived the easiest life there is, but your mother was not at all bitter. No, she wasn't bitter. And the other thing that I think, at least for me, Becky, if that was me, that would really make me question my faith. Yeah, no kidding. I, like, like, excuse me, why me? <laughs> what did yeah. I do to deserve this, right? Yeah. And But my mother had such incredible faith. And I'm not talking about religion. Like she, she was Catholic, but I'm not talking about the fact, because I think they're different. Mm-hmm. But my mother had so much faith. And was so grateful. It was just. Mm, Tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean when you say her faith wasn't being a Catholic? I mean, she was Catholic, but Mm -hmm. I mean, it was more than, Mm -hmm. I, you know, I I can, I can go to church on Sundays. My mother lived her faith. My mother prayed the rosary Mm -hmm. every single day. My mother wasn't walking around gossiping about this person Mm -hmm. and that person. It was more, she just had immense faith. Mm -hmm. And your mother was always loving. You know, people like to say love is an action, (laughs) (laughs) but it is. And your mother was giving and cooking for people every year of her life. How many people did your mother mother? How many people did she parent? How many people did she house and feed in her lifetime? So in her obituary, she gave birth to, well, she gave, one of my brothers died at birth, but Mm -hmm. so there's three of us, Mm -hmm. but I listed, I think it was 15 people as her children Mm -hmm. (laughs) because of how many people, like you said, were in the home that she, you know, came into the home. My mom took care of, in addition to her sisters when they were dying and my grandpa, and she was just so incredibly generous and caring. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't like, oh, they, you know, would pop over for, you know, for a snack every now and again. They lived in your home. Your mother (laughs) raised 15, 15 different children across the span of how many years? Oh, my goodness. I mean, when she was ill and passing, uh, she still had one of my nephews. So Mm. I don't know. So 50 years, more than 50 years. Yeah. 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 There was no empty nest. No, there was never an empty <laughs> nest. No. <laughs> no. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. no. You know, you say in one part of your book that you got used to sharing your mother, but there was a sense of you you said it and I believe it and I believe you did it out of love. But there was I don't want to say reluctance, but well, let me just put it this way like love is also being sacrificial, and that was part of your way of loving other people is you were willing to sacrifice the time or attention that you would have gotten from your mother if you had, you know, only two siblings at home with you versus <laughs> you know, 14 more, you know, so, or 15 more, you know, to, to round out the 16. So tell me a little bit about that. And, you know, did you have to go through a process of moving away from bitterness for that? And also at what point did you realize again, like most people aren't like your mom, (laughs) you know, most people aren't that extraordinary. Did you as a teenager also feel like, oh, my mom's the worst. Or did you at some point, like, when did, when did that happen that you went, wow, this woman is really amazing. And the world needs to know about her because I, I, Diana, I'm so glad you wrote this book because I, I, I've said it so many times, but I'll say it again. We really need to, these are the stories we need to read. These are the people we need to elevate. These are the people we need to be like. So sweet. Mm. So I, you know, I, I think definitely when I was younger, I, there was resentment, right? Because mm. I want, like, I think you were 
quite intuitive to pull that out. <laughs> it was definitely something I had to come to grips with because I, I did. I was her older daughter and I, you know, wanted more time with her. Mm. And I think it was Becky. And, and I definitely went through my turbulent teens, not super severe. And honestly, I was always pretty, even though she was super loving, I was terrified of her. Let's not be kidding. Oh, like, oh yeah. Like she, she was mm. like, Mm, you know, suffering had made her flinty also. Oh yeah. She, okay. you, you did not mess with my mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you live to talk about it. So okay. Like, no, 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 no. I like to know that side of this. I like, <laughs> yes. it's, it's more human. I like this. Okay. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. she definitely was pretty strict and yeah, no. Mm-mm. And, but I think it was when I moved away and I went to college and was out on my own and, you know, meeting other people's parents more and, more outside of my little community that I grew up in. And I, that's when it started like the aha. And then when I had my own children, mm. it was like, wow. Cause it, I mean, it is exhausting to be a parent. <laughs> I mean, it just <laughs> is. Right. And I had two. So I was, God, how did you do that? You know, yeah. over and, over. and, and be, she had such an amazing capacity to be present with you. Mm. So even though there's all this stuff going on in the house and it's, it's always, there's a lot, but if she was talking to you, she really was talking to you. Mm. Really was listening. My mother was an amazing listener Mm. and she, and she, so I think because she was this really amazing listener, that's why people were so drawn to her Hmm. because I, I think that's kind of a lost art. Mm-hmm. Right. We, mm-hmm. we, we were talking earlier about all the distractions that we have in our lives with all of our electronics and gadgets mm-hmm. and there's so much going on. And she was just a f- phenomenal listener. I'm picture, I'm trying to picture this, right? Because honestly, I'm, I'm learning at the feet of your mother right now, because sometimes I feel like I do a good job of that. And sometimes I feel so can't zero in. And I'm, I'm trying to imagine when did this happen? Did it happen in the kitchen? Would your mom put down her knife and look at you? Would you, you know, get a cutting board and chop with her? Like, when did this, when did this happen? How did she do it? Please pardon the interruption. We will be right back to Diana in a moment. I just wanted to share something very quickly with you. As always, I am so honored to share this story. And as I say, these are exactly the types of stories that I believe deserve to be shared with the world. As a wedding photographer for nine years, I am passionate about telling stories through images. And now I tell these guest stories through images of their cherished recipes. As this community grows and you, my listeners, are connecting deeply with the stories of my guests, I wanted to make some of these images available to you as wall art for your kitchen, dining room, or any other part of your home. For me personally, it's important to only hang art in my home that is personal to me. Images that have a story and remind me of something inspiring or exciting. If that's the kind of wall decor that you also love, you can shop these images in the Storied Recipe print shop simply by going to thestoriedrecipe.com and clicking print shop. Let's return to Diana. So that's where we connected was in the kitchen. Absolutely. Yeah. She would continue cooking, but that's when she really, when she really was mine, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's- we were cooking together. Yeah. Right. Right. Do you think that's part of the reason that you love cooking because it was that moment? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I've always loved to eat though. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like- Yes, so. but- yeah, yeah. I, I I believe in that so much. I, I I think I may have even told you this on our last when when you interviewed me, but I always 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 made a point of sitting down every single day and reading to my kids because I love reading so much and I wanted them to and I felt like if they associated reading with being with me, with being close to me and that physical warmth, they would love reading. It would just necessarily happen. And that's what happened with you in cooking. Yeah. And that's so lovely that you did that with your boys. It's really lovely. It's my favorite time of the day. I'm not one for playing with them. I did. I was not good about that, but I always read to them, but I didn't like play Legos with them and stuff like that. Some people do that. I, I didn't, I cooked with them and I read with them. (laughs) So fantastic. Mm -hmm. So 
we do talk a lot about cooking and stuff on this podcast, right? That it's meaningful. You know, <laughs> it's interesting, Diana, because I started the podcast because I did feel like food was meaningful and recipes were cherished. But I feel that so many guests have come on or so many listeners have talked to me and made me understand that it's so much more than I thought it was when I started this podcast. And your story very, very, very much did that for me. It Your book really did bring cooking again into the sacred realm. So tell me, tell us what cooking meant for you and for your mother's and for you and for your relationship with your mother in the last 13 months of her life. So for us, cooking definitely was our love language. It's where we connected Mm -hmm. and none of her family recipes had ever been written down. I had never written them down and I could make them kind of, (laughs) um, but not perfect them. So having those last 13 months when she was in hospice and I knew that this was it, she was dying. It really forced me to perfect her recipes. And because when we cook together, she would always come behind me and fix whatever it was that I was making. (laughs) So if I was making chili beans, I'd leave the room and I'd come back and they'd be a completely different color. And I'd be like, what did you do? You know, so even if I was really trying to pay attention and so bless her heart, but when she was in a hospital, hospital bed and no longer capable of walking, and I basically would take her spoonfuls of whatever I made, Mm -hmm. That's how I was finally able to perfect her recipes. It was this incredible gift that she gave me. Mm -hmm. And I was writing them down because I knew Mm -hmm. that this was it. Mm. It's just incredible. It's incredible. And then you were able to give that to your family. Yes. Mm -hmm. And physically, it meant something to your mother because your mother, there was a practical gift that cooking gave your mother also, which is that she had this, she had this wish when she went into hospice. Can you tell everyone about that? Do you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) I do. Absolutely. So when she went into hospice very early on, Mm -hmm. at first she was very accepting of, you know, that she was dying. And then later she realized that she was my, one of my nieces was expecting her very first great grandchild. And my mother was like, I'm going to stay alive for this. I'm going to meet her. And so, you know, we were told three days. And when she made this decision, I think we still had six months left before the baby would come. And so I was kind of like, okay, if you're in it, I'm in it. Mm. And and the other thing was, is that part of her illness, uh, one of the things that happens to those patients, she had COPD, and congestive heart disease is they stop eating. They lose a ton of weight. And my mom didn't want to eat anything except her own recipe. So I was still, that's why I was (laughs) going- And lemon donuts. And lemon donuts, (laughs) lemon donuts and her her food. And so I was going on the weekends and cooking all of her food and cooking her Mm -hmm. recipes to help her. And, and, you know, she did eventually, you know, slow down on the eating, but I, I think it you know, it, it, we were, we were also blessed that she could still taste and enjoy food because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that was also helpful. And at the end when she could no longer do that, that was quite sad for me. That was painful. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But you, you did it. And I, I must add, and I know you would want to do this also. I have to give so much honor and respect to your sister, Isabella mm-hmm. also, but you and your sister together as a team, you cooking and there on the weekends, her every day during the week, you got her to the birth of her great granddaughter. Yes, we did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it was really amazing. My sister mm-hmm. did for her. Absolutely. Yeah. And Diana, I have to ask you this. I I didn't I didn't have it in the questions, but there was like this question that was weighing on me as I read the book because, you know, like you mentioned, some people have told you that it was a blessing and it was healing for them, and some people have mentioned that it was too painful. And it does get painful to read and to put ourselves in your shoes and your mother's shoes as her suffering wore on. I I just have to ask if you're willing to say this. Do you feel that the 13 months was a gift or do you feel it was just an injustice of more suffering? It was definitely a gift for me. Mm. 
most definitely a gift. And I think for her too, Mm -hmm. because she did get to meet her great granddaughter. And actually Marisol was, you know, six months old when my mother passed. So, Mm -hmm. and I thought about that a lot because there was a point uh, where we almost lost her that if I probably hadn't been at the hospital and gone to get help, she would have died that night. Mm -hmm. But I do think it was a gift and I'm very grateful for it. It was at the very end, I was ready to let her go because I could, I just, yeah, I just could not. Mm -hmm. It just got to the point where I just could no longer see her suffer the way she was suffering. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm just like, Becky, I wasn't thinking about writing a book when I was going through this experience. Mm -hmm. And what's really amazing is that I was able to write the book because during this whole experience, I was texting and messaging friends on Facebook and whatever. I had like a complete diary of everything that happened because I wondered about that. I yes. wonder I've won as I was reading, I was like, how does she remember all this? But it was too detailed for it not to be accurate. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you of course you make it clear, like I'm not gonna say I said this word for word, but this was the gist of the conversation. But I mean, that was well, it was 40 visits of conversations that you recounted in a lot of detail. And I wondered how that's how that's how that's how that's how, because many times when she would go to bed at night and I would be like, Oh, maybe we'd had a tough day. Or even Mm -hmm. if we had a good day, I was messaging, you know, my, my boyfriend at the time or Mm -hmm. a girlfriend or somebody. So that's, so when a friend recommended to me that I needed to write this book and, and I started thinking about it and I went, oh my gosh, I probably have notes. I probably have so much already mm-hmm. as far as detailed information about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just happened organically. This is amazing. Did you feel that your faith, I want to talk about your mother's faith, but I am curious first, did your faith waver as you watched this or did it, was it strengthened? That's also a really great question. I think it probably strengthened. And Mm -hmm. the reason why is that if you would have told me going into this, that I'd be able to get through it, Mm. I'd have said, no way. Mm -hmm. If you outlined what I was going to happen, what I was, the way I was going to need to show up, Mm -hmm. I'd have been like, yeah, I can't do that. That's how I feel reading it. I feel like I couldn't do it. I couldn't do what Diana did. But I think having gone through this experience is that I really believe with everything that I am, that our superpower is love. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, scientists say that we use like 10% of our brain or some small percentage of our whole brain. I think that we use a very small percentage of our capacity to love Mm -hmm. and to be generous with our love. Except your mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why I I think that is so insightful what you just said. And I think that's why we need to read stories like this and hear about people like your mother, because it pushes us. We've become very complacent. I've become very complacent using 10% of my love. And these stories push us like (laughs) to use a lot more. Mm. Mm -hmm. A lot more. And I think the other thing, Becky, is that when I look back at that experience, being able to leave Santa Maria after she passed away and after the funeral, and I had no regret in my heart. Mm -hmm. I had no regret about, Mm -hmm. I, of course, was terribly sad that she was gone, but I had no regret with how I had shown up. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing way to feel. Mm Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how do you feel that your faith got you to that point? What part did your faith play? My faith, I think as I kept going and I would feel like I couldn't, and I'd be like, yeah, you made it through that. You're, you're going to make it. Mm-hmm. And I have a lot of faith in the Virgen de Guadalupe. I have her candle lit right now. And, and I would just pray to her. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That's who I would pray to quite a bit about just get me through it. And my mother had been such an example. She had shown me by the way she took care of her sisters and her grandfather, my grandfather, excuse me, and all the other people in my family. So she had laid the roadmap of how mm-hmm. you're supposed to take care of people. Like I, I knew the way I just mm-hmm. had to be willing to take those steps. Mm-hmm. And now you've you've laid them for us, which again, I'm so grateful for. I really am. So so tell us about, if you can, tell us about this really extraordinary story of your mother's death. So we were all with her. There was many of us that were with her. I think there was like 10 of us in the room. And my sister is an RN, so she knew that we were very, very close. And I was holding my mother's arm because we could no longer hold her hands and just because of what she was going through. So, Mm -hmm. and we were all sitting around and talking and it started raining. And so my oldest son and my sister's partner went outside to cover some things in the backyard. And so we were still talking and, and all of a sudden my mother had the, it's, I think they call it the death rattle. So Mm -hmm. you could hear her the way she was breathing. Mm -hmm. And I looked over and she was no longer breathing. And I told my sister, I was like, oh my God, I, th- I think she's gone. And my, like, you know, we start checking her. And at that moment, or just a few moments before that, my son and this woman had come in after, and they're like, did you see the man in the window? Did you, did you see a man? And we're like, what? And we were in my sister's living room and we're like, no, what are you talking about a man? And they were like, he was wearing a cowboy hat uh, and he had jeans on and a plaid shirt. And so when my mother stopped breathing, I was like, oh my goodness, my dad came for her mm-hmm. because that's the way my father always dressed. That was his, <laughs> that was his uniform basically. And so that was really reassuring Becky. Mm-hmm. And, and I have t- so much faith that, you know, this isn't the end for us. And mm-hmm. to know, you know, two, not one person, two people saw him outside. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, mm-hmm. but Two people who didn't know to look for him. No, they didn't know look to look for him. And he had passed away before my son was born. So he didn't know what he looked like as far as, you know, he'd only seen the pic and photographs. And so, yeah, so that's, it was, it was quite remarkable. That that's mm-hmm. how it happened. Mm. I can't quite say anything yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a little choked up over here. So towards the end of your book, I I marked it down. It's on page 337. You had a conversation with your mother and you told her that you felt like you'd never be able to make tamales without her. And now I love knowing that this mole sauce that you've shared with us was in, is in those tamales. So, and, and you didn't make food for her wake, even though you had been cooking day and night. So after she died, how was it to begin making her recipes again? Is it something you did, you know, right away with a joy and a lightness in your heart? Was it something that took you months and the first time it was just with heaviness and tears? How, how was that for you? So I stayed away from cooking her food at first, mm-hmm. for definitely. And then one night I was kind of on autopilot and I just started making her Spanish rice. Mm. And as soon as I smelt it, I just started crying because mm. it just was a... We always had Spanish rice. There's a very distinct smell to it. And I was like, oh, mom, you know, so I just started bawling. But what I also realized that first time, because I'd been trying to not make some of her food, was I felt her. Like I felt Mm -hmm. that connection with her through her Mm -hmm. her food. Mm -hmm. So it got easier. And eventually I stopped crying when I make her food. But Mm -hmm. definitely (laughs) now it's more of a connection. Mm -hmm. And making her tamales, that is no joke. Like I, last Mm -hmm. year was the first time. (laughs) So it was just nine years ago that she's passed. Mm -hmm. Actually, last week was the anniversary of her death. Mm -hmm. And I didn't make tamales. Last year, I hosted my very first tamale veda and we made the tamales with some friends and I would not make the mole ones. And this year during the pandemic Mm -hmm. was the first time I made them without her Mm -hmm. on my own by myself. And I Mm -hmm. made the mole ones. Mm -hmm. So it took me nine years to do it. Mm -hmm. And actually I was terrified, but once I got my hands in the the masa and I started doing things, it all just came back to me. Like Mm -hmm. my hands remembered. Mm 
mm. white today. Mm-hmm. And did they taste like your mom's? They did. Mm. They really did. And, <laughs> well and done. I, I had this whole like prayer thing and I had my, 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 my candle. I'm like, okay, help me. Cause I don't know what I'm doing here. And, you know, and it just, and, and I, it just came back. It just all kind of came back, which was amazing. Cause the, the year before i had had friends who were helping me remember how to do it, but, mm-hmm. but, but this year by, by myself. So I made 187 tamales by myself. How long did that take you? Three days. <laughs> oh, three long days, I bet. Yes. Yeah, but it was fun. It still was fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Diana, I just want to thank you so much for, first of all, again, for, well, <laughs> for really who you are and what you put out there in the world. Like I said, we didn't get to talk about this, but you taught me so much about this idea of approaching things with ease and your cheerfulness and your personality, the way they come through and your emails and your YouTube channel and everything is so delightful. And then really, truly, this book is, well, I think you said it best. I think that this is the book we should read. I think this book should be required reading in schools so that we can figure out how to increase our capacity to love or how to, our capacity is there how to um, function at our potential, I guess. And I just really appreciate the example of your mother that you shared that. I appreciate your example and also how vulnerable you were in the book because there were times you would talk about little irritations with, you know, your siblings or other, I mean, you were shockingly open and vulnerable in the book about, you know, family dynamics. I was amazed by that. And then I just uh, really, really do appreciate the time that you took to share this with us this evening. I hope that it wasn't too painful to talk about it. Oh, not at all. No, it was, it was, it helps me to remember like why I need to do a better job of marketing it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Okay. I need to get back. And I've, I've actually been thinking about turning it into an audio book. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think I might be ready to maybe start working on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to hear it in your voice would be quite extraordinary. Yeah, I don't think I would have been able to do that <laughs> mm-hmm. a few years ago, but I think I'm getting better, like getting through this. I didn't cry. I usually have cried when I talk about my book and I didn't cry tonight. So thank you, Becky. <laughs> so. Well, you made me cry. <laughs> so that's not a, No, that's not a bad thing. These are the things we need to think about, right? I think there's a verse in Ecclesiastes. It is better to enter a house of mourning than a house of feasting since death is the end of every man and the living should take this to heart. There was an entire year that my only you know, some days I would pray more, but if I prayed, if I only prayed one prayer, it would be that I would number my days and gain a heart of wisdom. I think that we have to talk about these things because this is where we're headed. And, you know, don't we want to have looked back and, you know, had no regrets, like you said, you had leaving your mother's house and the way that your mother had no regrets about her life. No, she didn't. I mean, she, she did not. Yeah. But Becky, thank you so much for reading the book and for honoring her and, you know, just talking about so beautifully the way you spoke of her and about me. So it's really wonderful. I really appreciate it. It's my joy. Could you tell everyone where to find you and where to find your book? Yes. So you can find uh, me at mollymama.com, M-O-L-E, mama, M-A-M-A.com. And that has all the links to all the way, other ways to find me, <laughs> including more information about my book and how to buy it. But you can buy my book on Barnes & Noble as well as Amazon. And it is called Molly Mama, A Memoir of Cooking, Love, and Loss. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Becky. Yes. Thank you all so much for tuning into Diana's episode. I would highly recommend Diana's YouTube channel podcast, which she has interviewed me on and definitely her book, all of which you can find in the show notes on my website, along with Diana's 30 minute mole recipe and very generously from her, her Spanish rice recipe. Next week, we'll be listening in to a globe-trotting, Michelin-starred pastry chef who is just as generous and humble as Diana, 
You will love Monique and you definitely want to hit that subscribe button right now so you don't miss Monique's interview. Also, as always, please think of someone who would love this episode. I'll give you a minute just right now to think of someone who would really appreciate Diana's words. And would you please send this podcast to them? Also, if you have another moment, rate and review the podcast. Each and every one of these acts really, truly moves the needle and helps me to grow. Um, They mean so much to me personally, and I hope that you will take a second to do one of those things. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for your support. And I do hope you have a great week, my friends. 